Let us bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day that you have given to us. We praise your name. We glorify you. And we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence. Lord, I pray that your word would touch our hearts and our minds so that we might be able to serve you and experience the life that you desire us to have. We give you glory and we give you praise and we give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been reflecting a lot lately about the ministry of Jesus and how we as his people can respond to his ministry. How he wants to help us and provide for us so that we might be able to complete the mission that he's given for each one of us to walk in. I'd like to look at a, a few verses in the Gospel of John today. But before looking at the verses that I'm going to eventually get to, I, I want us to first turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 26. Because John here explains why he wrote his gospel in the first place. And I'm going to begin with a, a little bit of the story that he tells just before he actually says why he's written this. Because he's referring back to examples or works that Christ has done. And so, beginning in verse 26, um, we pick up the reading. And after eight days, this is eight days after the resurrection. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Previous to this, Thomas was not with them when Jesus appeared. And Jesus came... And the doors being shut stood in their midst, and he said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now you recall that the last time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples. Thomas was not among them. And then they were telling Thomas that Jesus had appeared to them. And Thomas said, unless I see him for myself, uh, unless I can put my finger in his nail prints, unless I can put my hand in his side, I won't believe. But Jesus even obliges him to do just that. And then he says, Thomas answered him, and he said, my Lord and my God, and Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John goes on to write, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John wrote this book with a couple of purposes in mind. One is that we would come to a place of believing in Jesus, but also in believing in Jesus we would have life. You recall when Jesus spoke in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he said, the thief comes to do what? To still kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that more abundant, right? And so John's whole purpose of writing was that we could come to believe in Jesus Christ as the anointed one of God. And he was writing to the churches later on in his life when all the eyewitnesses were going to be done away with. In other words, they were going to die. And he wants the right to the church to continue to strengthen the church to say, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses, but now you need to listen to the story that we tell. And if you will believe the story that we tell, you too can believe in him. 
So John's purpose, he's re writing the gospel, he's reflecting back on what Jesus taught, the works that he did, and all these things are to solidify the churches that John is ministering to in their faith. What Jesus said, though, is this, that, that blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And that's why John's writing. He says, I'm writing that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. All that he wrote, all the examples that he selected, were to help his readers simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In addition to believing, he desires that they would experience all the life that was meant to be experienced because of having a union with Christ. I want you to believe, but John's writing so they can believe, but also so that you might experience life in his name. Yes. See, the ability to believe and to behave, or the ability to believe and to experience life in Jesus' name is part of the plan of God for our lives. But it's hinged on receiving the helper. God has given a promise. And the promise of God, the helper, the Holy Spirit, is to connect everything that Jesus did and taught on the earth and everything that Jesus would continue to do and teach from heaven. All of us know what it means to have a helper. And some of us cry out when we're not getting help. Isn't that true? You know, we, we, we know that there's some things maybe we like to do ourselves, but the reality is there's many things we can't do by ourselves. It's always better to have someone else's help. I know many tasks that we do, whether it's, uh, you know, my own personal experience in construction pro projects, for example, there's some things that are too difficult to do alone. You, you can't lift up something that's heavy. You can't necessarily, you know, uh, uh, maneuver something into place. Sometimes you need an extra pair of hands. Sometimes you need a, an extra pair of eyes. You, you know, it, it, and whether it means that somebody helps you to lift something, maneuver it in place, provide some kind of knowledge or skill that they have, maybe encourage us, even provide a companionship. Help us enable us to do more work than we can do by ourselves. And it helps us, it helps, it helps us to complete something that we can't do by ourselves. It's no wonder that Jesus spoke of our need of the Holy Spirit as the helper. You still in the book of John, just turn back to chapter 14. Let me read you a couple of verses of scripture here. Chapter 14, verse 15 to 17. Jesus says this, if you love me, do you love him? Yes. Well, I've got a couple of him. Yes. <laughs> if you love me, he says, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And he will give you another helper, that he might abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Verse 12 to 14. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. How many know Jesus has chosen us to do a very specific task? He's given us something to do. He's looking for us to bear fruit. And he doesn't expect us to bear that fruit without his help. We've been talking about around this scripture of John 15, 16 in the past several weeks where Jesus says, You did not choose me, 
But I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name he may give you. Jesus has given us the helper to dwell in us, to guide us into all truth, to instruct us in the way of Jesus, to give us the power that's necessary to accomplish the assignments that he's given us. It is through the Holy Spirit that we can commune with Jesus. It's through the Holy Spirit that we can hear His voice. It's through the Holy Spirit that we are empowered for the work that He's given us to do. It's through the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, that we can ask the Father in Jesus' name for what is needed to accomplish the mission. Amen. It's through the Holy Spirit that our prayers are answered. Most of all, it's through the Holy Spirit that we can enjoy the presence of the Lord in our daily life. Notice what he said. The world does not see him. The world does not know him. Sometimes when we talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I think within the church context, there are still people saying, I don't see him. I don't hear him. And that's an important thing to begin to understand because Jesus said to those that believe. He said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will give you a helper. In other words, you and I don't have to walk this walk alone. We don't have to do the work alone. We don't need to struggle. We, don't, we have his support. We have his help. We have his comfort. We have his companionship. We have his love. This is why the disciples were told, wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit before they could actually accomplish the commission, before they could even begin the commission. Let me just read to you a couple of the verses that we get the commission from in, in Luke 24, verse 44 to 49, and then I'll look at Acts 1, 4 to 8. Luke 24, 44 to 49, Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples here after the resurrection, after he's appeared to them, and just prior to his ascension. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, of the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. In other words, he was opening up all the Old Testament scriptures that related to him. They were pointing to him. And then he said this. Basically what he says is, here's the gospel. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. This is the work you've been called to do. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In other words, Jesus is saying, here's the gospel. The gospel is the fact that he lived and he died and he rose. You know, and that, that there's the forgiveness of sins. This is what you need to preach to the world that, that if they can receive the forgiveness of sin because of the work of Jesus. You are to be the witnesses. You're the one that's going to tell the world about this. But in order for you to be that kind of a witness, you need to wait. You need to receive. You need to be empowered by my Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 8, they were assembled again together. It's another picture of the same time period. He, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? 
it's interesting that the disciples, even after walking with him for three years, still didn't understand about the kingdom of God, even though he was opening up their scripture, uh, open up the scriptures to them. There, there were still things he needed to tell them. But right now they could not understand. And, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his, his own authority, but you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. See, there's a commission that God's given. He's saying you're going to be a witness. But it's very important that we understand that he wants the church, the disciples, to be empowered with the Holy Spirit. It's something that had the Holy Spirit has been working around them, but now he would be in them. When you look at the Greek word for, for what's been translated as the helper, the word is the word paraclete. And para means alongside. So part of the definition of the helper is someone comes alongside. The kletos part of that word means to call. So the kletos, the, the Holy Spirit, is calling us to walk alongside of him to get the work done. Amen. And from the description, we get other descriptions like this. Encourager, counselor, advocate, witness, judge, empowerer. The promise is that the Holy Spirit, our helper, will be personal. He will be relational. He will abide with us forever. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. Now Jesus had already proclaimed in, God, in John's Gospel, in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the truth, but he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. In speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is to enlighten and open us up to the words and works of Jesus. The paraclete is subject to Jesus. L listen to what I'm going to say here. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, is God's Spirit. It, Jesus said this. you got to understand the Holy Spirit is under authority. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you Jesus' words. He's our helper. I'll come back to this thought in a minute. The Holy Spirit is the helper. He's the paraclete. He's the one who will be the indwelling presence that unites us with Jesus in his glory. Jesus came to the earth bodily. He rose bodily. He's seated in heavenly places. But what connects us to Jesus is his Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would enable us to do the works of Jesus. John 14, 12 to 13. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Look also in chapter 16, verse 7. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now there's a work that the Holy Spirit does in the world. We'll look at the next few verses in verse 8 to 11. Because the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world. But the Holy Spirit actually comes to convict the world through the witness of men and women. Because as we go as his witness, as we speak forth his word, what he's doing is convicting the world. It says in John 8, uh, 16, 8 to 11, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they did not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Let me just explain these verses for a few minutes. 
The Holy Spirit wants to work through our witness to expose the sin of the world, and that's why it's important for us to speak the truth of God's Word. Because at the root of all sin is a rejection of Jesus. When we reject Jesus, then what we're going to do, if there is no faith in Jesus, then what do we have? Self-centeredness. We have hatred, we have immorality. All the concrete signs of unbelief take over our lives. And the advocate it also brings to light the righteousness of Jesus because he unmasks the unrighteousness, the false justice of the world. In crucifying Jesus, what the, the world said, the, the world was judging Jesus, the one that was the innocent one, the world judged him as being guilty. But the Father vindicated Jesus, declared him the righteous one by raising Jesus from the dead. And the fact that he returned to his Father rebukes the unrighteousness of the world. So the world is convicted of righteousness when Jesus is lifted up by the Spirit, the Helper, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit will make it clear that the Prince of the world is judged. For Jesus will meet, Jesus is speaking forwardly here, but he says, Jesus will meet the devil at the cross and dethrone him through his resurrection. While the evil one continues to thrash around and the struggle might go on, his power has been destroyed. And in the power of the Spirit, the apostles are going to go forth now, speak boldly, announcing that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and the devil has been overthrown. That's the good news of the Gospel. This is what John is saying here. But there are many things that, that can't be said to the disciples now because they can't bear it. That's what he says in verse 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority or on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. And he will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine, declare it to you. And all the things that the Father has are mine, therefore I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. This is why it's important for us to study the epistles. Because what we learn in the epistles is the continued teaching of Jesus as he was revealing it to his apostles. You know, they're walking this walk. They're walking it out. They're, they're going to make disciples of all nations. And as they're doing that, they're hearing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the voice of Jesus continuing to teach them. The Holy Spirit comes as the teacher to illuminate all of Jesus' teachings. As he has come to the first century disciples, the Holy Spirit comes to each one who will humble himself, each one that's a seeking disciple, each one that's eager to, to learn all that is in Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit is a gift. He's God's gift to us. It's Jesus walking with us, teaching us, illuminating his word to us. As each person submits to the spirit of truth, he grows in spiritual wisdom and increasingly is conformed to the image of Christ. It's coming to him. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. Jesus promised his disciples that, that he would continue to teach them if they continue to trust in him. They could depend on the Spirit of God for wisdom. They could depend on the Spirit of God for discernment, for every new opportunity that was before them. The disciples didn't know what strange or demanding situations would come in their life as they went and did the mission of Jesus in the years ahead. But the Spirit would give them understanding. The Spirit would give them illumination about Jesus in all these situations. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Acts chapter 8, you have <coughs> Philip that pulls alongside of an Ethiopian eunuch. You know, it was the Spirit of God that directed him there. 
And, and then Philip, in verse, you know, I think it's 30 or 31, he, he, he asks the man if he understands what he's reading. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? Amen. This is what he asks Philip. In verse 35, it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus Christ to them, to him. How could I understand? Unless someone guides me, is what he said. But the Holy Spirit working through Philip guided the Ethiopian eunuch to the point where he says, look, here's water. What forbids me to be baptized? That eunuch came to know Christ. He came to believe in Jesus Christ that day. He became part of the church. In Acts chapter 10 and, and 11, I mean, there's this story. It's an incredible story. You have Cornelius who's, who, who's praying. He was a devout man. He was a Gentile, though. And God gives him a vision. And he sends for people to go to get Peter in Joppa. And, and while Peter's in Joppa, he has a vision. And he sees this sheet come down, and he sees all this nice stuff on there. You know, pork and all, all the things he, he had never eaten all his life, and Jesus says, rise up, kill and eat. He said, I never had a Sharif sandwich in my life. <laughs> I didn't start. I'm not going to start now. I didn't have that, you know, what do they call that, pork and little necks. You know, I never had any of that stuff. You know, and, and so he's, he's fighting against what the Spirit of God is saying. You know, three times a sheet comes down, you know, and I, I think God just gives him a little bit more, you know, a little casserole, you know, a little bit something else. And he's seeing all this stuff and he's saying, no, I, I can't eat that. Then the men come knocking on the door. He says, look, I, you know, and the Spirit of God tells Peter, go. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, he's gone, but he had this vision. And obviously it's working in his life. And now he shows up at Cornelius' house. He has a bunch of Gentiles, and, he, and they, they, they've assembled. I mean, he's gathered his whole family there. And he said, you know, whatever you tell us, Peter. And Peter begins to preach Christ to him. And to his own surprise, yeah. the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And, and Peter's looking, and he's saying... You know, and I think in verse 34 and 35, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This great door to the Gentile church was opened up. Peter didn't understand, but the Spirit of God moved him to a place of understanding, illumination, that then became foundation for the worldwide mission. This is why we need to pay close attention to the epistles because in them we find the teachings of Jesus as they were revealed to the apostles through the Holy Spirit and how we're to live out our lives as the church of Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit led the disciples, the implication is that he will guide us in our own walk, that he will lead us. And I want to note that it's the Father who takes all things that are the Son's, this wisdom and truth for all his people, and he pours them out through the helper, the paraclete, that Jesus may be glorified. Following the Holy Spirit will never cause us to have some obscure teaching that is not founded in Jesus Christ. Amen. This is important. I see so many people that are following dreams and visions and all these other kind of things. You have to understand, the Holy Spirit is revealing the things that Jesus wants to tell you. Hallelujah. It's never going to be contrary to His Word. Through the unity of the Godhead, we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We see this eternal intimacy within God through His ministry. And it is in believing in Jesus that we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's an inviting in Christ 
that the Holy Spirit produces this sustainable fruit in our lives. It's only through this union, this is what John's trying to say, it's only through this union that we can really experience life as it was meant to be. This is why John wrote the gospel, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may have life in his name. The Holy Spirit is such an important part of the sustained mission of Jesus. I feel like sometimes we sort of separate these things. It's like, I can follow Jesus, but this Holy Spirit thing makes me kind of crazy. It's the same. You, you can't follow Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is confirming who Jesus is and what he wants from us. It's Jesus walking in the earth through us. Coming under the obedience of Christ is paramount for us to receive the gift. Go back to John 14, 23 to 26. Jesus said to them, if anyone loves me. Uh, we have lots of people talking about love today. But they define love on their terms. We have to define it based on his terms. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. But he who does not love me does not keep my words. I mean, if we're not keeping his words, what's it saying about our love for Jesus? And the word which you hear is not mine. In other words, Jesus is saying, this, this is not just me making this up. It's the word of my Father who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Holy Spirit, the Helper, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he'll bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. Only as we believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we loving Jesus? Only as we believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we loving Jesus? And we're keeping his word. You, you can't come into that union apart from believing in Christ Jesus as our Lord. The promise of the Holy Spirit is only received through our union with Christ. The Holy Spirit confirms what it means to come into union with Christ. It's not our terms, it's His terms. Amen. This is John's understanding, but it's also Peter's understanding. Look at chapter 2 of Acts, verse 36 to 41. After Peter was preaching, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And with this they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified, exhorting them, be saved from this perverse generation. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, 3,000 souls were added to them. Look, we are set apart. We are sanctified as we respond to the finished work of the cross in Jesus Christ. When we come to him, we're set apart. There, there's some misunderstanding, I think, and some confusion that comes in. It says, well, the Holy Spirit just going to kind of keep changing my mind, and at some point in time, I can come to Christ. That's not what the Word says. The Word says, submit to Christ and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God says, according to John, you, if you're in the world, you're not in Christ, you can't even see Him and you can't hear Him. Only through confession 
and repentance of our sins can we find forgiveness and pardon. It doesn't matter whether you come to an aisle, lift up your hand, do any of those things. Only through confession and repentance of our sins can we find forgiveness and pardon. Amen. It's in that union, it's in that confession that we become identified with Christ. We become identified with His teachings. We find life. And we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's the help we need. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He will guide us into all truth. He will declare to us the teachings of Jesus. We can expect power to do the work of missions. We can pray and receive answers. We, we can and will be fruitful if we depend on His strength, if we depend on His wisdom, if we depend on His illumination. Truly, we will experience life as Jesus meant us to have. Maybe there's some of you here today who never really made this declaration of faith. I'm not talking about how long you've come to the church. I'm not how long you've done whatever you're doing. I'm talking about an honest acknowledgement of sins. The sins we commit. The Bible says all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. A desire to come clean. A willingness to submit and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Christ. Because it's through this union that we're joined to Him. It's through this union that we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift of God is the very presence and wisdom of God that will empower us to live a life that's glorifying to God. Look, he's not saying, clean yourself up and then come to me. He's saying, come to me, I'll clean you up. No, you can't do it by yourself. You need a helper. But the helper can only come when you finally let go of yourself and surrender to him. There might be some of us here that, that need to make a recommitment to the Lord Jesus. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're trying to follow it, and sometimes I'm asking the question, how come the fruit's not there? How come the power's not there? How come there, the, the, just the joy's not there? Well, maybe it's because you're trying to read this book like an intellectual. But you never come to the place of saying that it's not my mind, it's your mind that I need. In the Philippians, Paul says, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Yes. Maybe we need to make a recommitment to the Lord Jesus and keep his commands. If you love me, keep my commands. And my Father will love you. And we'll come in. We're going to dwell in you. I'm going to send you a gift of my spirit. Oh, we need to seek him and abide in his presence so that the fruit can be seen in our lives and sustainable fruit because it's a mission he's called us to. We can never accomplish that. If Jesus thought they could accomplish that mission, he wouldn't have said, wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit is poured out. I want to take just a few minutes as we're close today to just take some time for us to respond. I actually asked Andrew to cut music a little bit so that we can have some more time in between for prayer, for responding. So we're not like pressed, like I, I got to get this done before the next service is in. Look, if all you do is listen to me and you walk out of here and then go talk football, basketball, baseball, food, whatever. You know, what you saw in the... We're, we're, God's not doing what He wants to do in our lives. There's a surrender that needs to happen. I, I, at any point in our lives, it's been many years, I don't even know how many years, uh, I can't count that much since I, I, I confessed the Lord Jesus Christ in my life, but I need to surrender more today than I ever did before. I need His strength more today than I ever did before. I need His wisdom more today than ever before for the mission that He's called me to do. And so do you. If you're going to do it in your own strength, you know what? You're, you're just, I'm okay. I'm all set. 
Yeah. I hear people say all the time, I'm all set. Well, that's good. But sometimes you need a helper. I had Zachary help me a few weeks back. Just because there was too many boxes to carry onto the second floor. So I got a young guy. He carried all of the boxes up to the second floor. I just kept working on my knees and I still couldn't stand up after. We need a helper. Like maybe, maybe you're at a point in your life where you say, man, nothing's working. I've, I've been here, I've been there, I've done this, I've done this. Today's the day that we can come and just bow before the Lord and say, Jesus, I give up. It's okay to say give up. What you're saying, I'm giving up of my own strength to do my own thing because you never purpose it to be that way. What you've purposed is for you to help me. But he can't help us if we just keep saying we're all set. Understand? Yes. If we never come to that place, if we never confess our sins, how can we ever get forgiveness for them? If we never bow the altar, how can we expect him to come and, and, and do a, a mighty work that he needs to do in our life? He wants to do a mighty work in our lives. He wants to do a mighty work in our church. But we've got to stop resisting what he wants to do. It's not good enough that your mother or father know the Lord. You need to know the Lord. All of us do. I'll just take some moment, and if you want to take some time of prayer, I'm just going to ask that maybe the maybe we can just play a little uh, background music. We don't need to have a closing song. We're going to take some time of prayer. There are people in your family that are maybe not here that you need to pray for, that they would come under the submission of God. But let me ask you this. Before you ask for them, can you honestly say that you feel like you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Can we just take an honest time? I don't care whether you want to pray with somebody or don't want to pray with somebody. Can we take some time maybe at the altar and just, just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to surrender today. Because I know that you want to do something. I know that there's something more. But let me tell you, we, we should have more people in our, in our Bible studies on Wednesday night. We should have more people taking part of our small groups on a Sunday morning. I don't know why we don't, but it says something about our hunger for God's Word. Because if we understood about the Holy Spirit, we understand He wants to teach us and guide us. But you know what? Yes, it, they, yes they spent time in prayer in the early church. Yes, they spent time in fellowship. And, and they spent time you know, together. But, but they also spent time in the Apostles' Doctrine, learning. We just looked at a few scriptures in John. Can you imagine writing this whole gospel just so that we can believe in Jesus Christ? But it wasn't enough to believe so that you might experience his life in you. Man, there's a, there's a preciousness that we find in Jesus when we come to him. You can't eliminate the cross because if you eliminate the cross, you never find the Savior. You can never find the resurrection power if you never bow at the cross. The Lord wants to do something in our lives. And, uh, you know, if you want prayer, I'll be glad to pray for you. If you want to just come and spend a little bit of time before the altar and just ask the Lord to do this work. Let me, let me, just, let me just have this prayer with us together. And then let's just spend a few moments just before the Lord and say, Lord, do a work in me. The food will wait. Amen? There's a, there's a food Jesus said to his disciples. There's a food that I have that you don't know anything about. It's to do the work of the Father. Lord, we just come to you today and we ask, there's nothing I can do. But surely there's something you can do. You want to bring us into a, an understanding of what it really means to believe in you. To believe in you is to love you. More than television. More than all these other stupid things that we do. To love you is to keep your commands, but we got to know what they are. Lord, we want you to come. Fill us. Strengthen us. 
we acknowledge that we need your help. You didn't leave us as orphans. In fact, you said, you'll be better off that I go. Because I'll send my spirit. You kept your promise, Lord. You still are the spirit of truth. You still speak through your spirit to our lives. We want to have ears to hear. We want to have hearts open to move. We want to receive the power that's necessary so that we can do the greater works that you've already committed us to do. But we need a fresh surrender before you, Lord, that we might see the doors of our own hearts open so that new enlightenment can come from your spirit day by day, that we get excited once again about the Lord Jesus Christ who loves us, who gave himself for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your great sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for the great gift that you give. Touch our hearts today, we pray. Mold us and shape us. That we might know you. That we might know the life that you had for us. I just invite you to come and spend some time in prayer. And If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd be glad to pray with you and walk through that. Let's trust that God wants to do something. He wants to pour out His Spirit like, like we haven't experienced before. There's so many places and so many, even churches that almost want to take out the move of the Holy Spirit. How can we say that we want to walk with you and then push you away? It doesn't make any sense. Lord, do a great work today, we pray. Conform us to your image. Come to the waters. <laughs> you invite us to come. Come and taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Come without price, for you've already paid it for us. Thank you, Lord. Strengthen us today, Lord. Fill us afresh. Give us your strength and your wisdom. We recommit ourselves to you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you praise. You are deserving of all honor and glory. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Dwell in this place. This is your home. We invite you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.